want to be like you. I just want to be with you. I just want what you have for my life, and I'm not willing to let anything else get in my way. I lay down everything else, every distraction, every worry, every concern, all pride, all fear, all anxiety. I throw it at your feet. And I just humble myself before your presence, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. You're so wonderful, Lord. You're so wonderful, Father. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. <laughs> we thank you, Jesus. Sometimes you got to just get lost in the presence of God. <laughs> Forget about where you're at. Forget about where you're standing, what you're wearing, who's next to you, what you're going to eat for lunch. And just put your eyes on Jesus. powerful time in worship. Amen. Thank you, Lord. There's nothing like the presence of God. Amen. <laughs> Y'all just have to excuse me for a second. I was not expecting all that. <laughs> Sometimes you got to raise your expectation though, right? <laughs> what were you expecting, Pastor Lauren? I don't know. What are you expecting? Are you expecting it to be just a regular Sunday? Not that we've ever had one of those around here. Say, I'm hungry. It's a new year, amen? It is. And we're going to see God do some amazing things in our lives. Amen? Well, we love you guys. Sorry, I'm trying to gather myself here. I'm a mess. But that's okay. Um, turn with me to Matthew chapter 2. We had such a wonderful time um, out at the ranch on New Year's Eve. So thank you to everybody who came out and joined us for that. That was such an awesome time. Lots of fireworks. We had some firepower there, didn't we? <laughs> and nobody got lit on fire, so that was good. But I tell you what, it's really great having your own. I mean, maybe that's debatable. Maybe I missed a few things. But, um, <laughs> but it's really great having your own space where you can just blow up whatever you want to blow up, right? <laughs> Pretty sure the old folks home next to us was not too excited about that. But anyways... All right, Matthew chapter 2. Now, when Jesus was born, okay, well, we're not going to read this whole thing. Let's see, what part are we going to read? Mm -mm 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 -mm. Okay, yeah, we're going to read it. All right, now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Herod the great, magi, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. Everybody say, to worship him. That was their purpose in finding Jesus, to worship him. Now, I know some of you are like, Pastor Lauren, we're still reading Christmas stories here? Yes, because it's not a Christmas story. It's a Bible story. Amen? And this is what has been burning on my heart for the last couple weeks. So I'm, I'm going to get it out. Praise the Lord. All right. So 
When Herod the king heard this, he was disturbed in all Jerusalem with him. So he called together all the chief priests and scribes of the people and anxiously asked them where the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed, was to be born. And they replied to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what was written by the prophet Micah. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not in any way least among the leaders of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly sent for the Magi and learned from them the exact time the star had first appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search carefully for the child, and when you found him, report to me, so that I too may come and worship him. And after hearing the king, they went their way, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went on before them, continually leading the way, until it came and stood over the place where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And after entering the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then after opening their treasure chests... They presented him gifts fit for a king, gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned by God in a dream not to go back to Herod, the Magi left for their own country by another way. So, you know, I was just considering this the other day. And there's some things that it's like you have to know, obviously, the context. Remember, the children of Israel, God's people, the nation of Israel, they were expecting a Messiah But at the same time, it had been like 400 years since they had had that prophecy. So, you know, they had been waiting for a while. It was kind of like the story their grandparents, their great-grandparents had told them and passed down. You know what I mean? So they were waiting for a while for this Messiah. And in a sense, you know, sometimes people, it's like you can easily lose touch with things when it's not constantly in front of you. You know what I mean? It wasn't like um, they heard a few months ago they had this prophecy. You know, no. It was a prophecy from 400 years ago that their grand, you know, those people told their kids and then told their kids and told their kids and told their kids, and and they wrote it down, and they had these scriptures, you know, they had these scrolls, they had evidence of this prophecy, but it was kind of detached from them. Okay, so, you know, the children of Israel, they're expecting a Messiah, but they're like, well, it's been 400 years since that prophecy. Maybe it'll be another 400 years. I mean, who knows? But the Magi, you know, it's unclear. A lot of us, we tend to think that there's three kings, like, you know, the Hispanics celebrate Three Kings Day this, this, this week, which I'm excited to participate in. Um, But, you know, like we refer to it as the three kings. And people do that because there were three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So they just think, oh, well, there's three kings. But the Bible doesn't necessarily give a specific number of how many wise men there were. They weren't necessarily kings either. They were wise men. They were very prominent figures. They were very wealthy figures. But they weren't necessarily kings. You know what I'm saying? They were wise guys. <laughs> and they, you know, and, and they came. Remember, you know, back in those days when they traveled, they didn't just show up just one guy. Like, it was an entourage that showed up at Jesus' house, okay, with, like, you know, their camels, their servants, laden down with all this stuff. And they were kind of like the scientists of those times as well because they were astrologers. And what's amazing about this, when I, like, stop and think, because you got to, you know, Sometimes you got to, like, just meditate on the Word of God, not just, like, read through it. You know what I'm saying? Like, sometimes you got to just chew on it and meditate on it and not just be like, okay, I read my three chapters. You know, I'm good. I'm good for today. Like, really, like, meditate on the Word of God. Think about the Word of God. So as I was thinking on this passage, you know, I was like, here you have these three wise, or these, not three, but, you know, this group of wise guys, right, that they come And, you know, it took a lot of effort for them to find Jesus in the first place, right? They had to search for him. They had to, like, go on a mission. If you've ever lost anything in your house, you know what kind of effort you have to apply to find that lost thing, right? Your wallet, your keys, your phone, your glasses, whatever it is that you lose, you know, you got to, like, search diligently for that. They were searching for a king because they saw this sign, you know? And they were following that. And they were diligently searching for him. And then when they got to him, remember, the Bible doesn't say, and it's it's actually kind of unlikely, that these wise guys were even um, Jews. It's actually very unlikely that they were even Jews. So they weren't like necessarily, I mean, there's a possibility they were. But for the most part, we're pretty sure that they weren't. There's different theories. Nobody knows for sure. But for the most part, we're pretty sure they were men from the east and they were not necessarily Jews. So they're not, they're not these Jewish guys waiting for their Messiah to come. They're astrologers who saw a sign and knew that a king was to be born 
and they searched diligently to find him. Why, what was their purpose to find him? Just to find them and be like, X marks the spot, we got him? No, no, no. What was their whole purpose to find him? Do you guys know? Yes, to worship him, to honor him, to acknowledge there's a king that's here and we're going to worship him. That was their sole purpose. For their whole journey, for, you know, all the effort for going before the king, they actually had to risk their life even going before King Herod because, you know, as you can read, King Herod was not, like, super excited that there was somebody uh, threatening his position, you know. So they went to great lengths to come and to worship him. Now, isn't that interesting? Not only did they go through all this effort and this journey to get there to worship him, but then, you know, they didn't just come and, and be like, Wow, it's a king. This is awesome. And, you know, no, no, no. They came to worship him. They bowed down before him. And then they poured out gifts of gifts that were fit for a king to honor him. And remember, he was not necessarily their savior. They did not know him as a savior. They did not um, even know him as the wonderful Jesus that we know who grew up and did all these miracles and died on the he, They didn't know him like that. You know what I'm saying? They did not know him as God's son. They knew him as a, as a king, and they just showed up to worship him as the king. And I got to thinking about that, and I was like, wow, you know, like, these guys know him through some signs. And they show up to worship him with great reverence, with great honor. Meanwhile, you and I know him as what? as our savior, as our redeemer, as our deliverer. Amen. We know who he is, right? We know who he is in our life. So, you know, if three wise guys can show up that they don't even know who he is, they just know who he is through this prophecy. They just know who he is through these signs that they follow in their little astronomy thing. And they go through such great lengths. They risk, they put their life on the line and then they get there to just simply not to be seen, not to be heard, just to drop off their treasure, just to lay down their worship. And then they go back to going about their business. That's it. And they don't know him like we know him. They just knew him through a sign. They just knew him through some prophecies. And, you know, it's like it dawned on me, like, man, that's, that's why so many people, that's why so many Christians actually struggle with the giving message and with giving because they don't know him. Because when you have a revelation about who he is, you'll never struggle to give and to honor and to worship him. And I know I'm talking to a group of people that love the Lord with all their heart, but I have to like share this because it's like sometimes people don't even know why they struggle with certain things. But the Bible's very clear where your treasure is, your heart will be. Amen? So your giving is a reflection of how you honor him. Your giving, listen to me now, is a reflection of who you esteem him to be in your life. Come on. It is a reflection of who he is in your life. And, you know, Pastor Alex says this all the time, and it's so true. You think about it, you're like, wow, it's so true. Every time that giving is, a, a, an occurrence of giving is highlighted in the Bible, it's because it has to do with honor. Like the Bible stops to record these instances where giving was done to honor. So, you know, and we, we always bring it back to this because this is where our giving should originate. It should always originate out of a place of worship and honor. Yes, we believe, you know, to rebuke the devourer. Yes, we believe in seed time and harvest. All of those things are true. But you separate that from honor and then your giving is really all about you. <laughs> right? Like, what if the devourer wasn't rebuked through your giving? Would you still give? What if, you know, the whole seed time and harvest thing didn't, wasn't a thing? Would you still give? Some people would not because they're giving. And that's why people got to get like, oh, start up to give and stuff because, you know, their giving is actually all about them. It's an emotional response or it's a, it's a, it's a um, I'm going to do this so that I get that back. Yes, you expect a harvest when you sow. Yes, of course. I mean, we believe that to the core of our being. But the heart of my giving has everything to do with my honor. The heart of your giving has everything to do with your honor. Amen? 
if he never did another thing for me, if he didn't rebuke the devourer, which he does, if he didn't multiply my seed 30, 60, 100 fold, which he does, I would still do whatever I have to do to worship him, to pour out my best on him. Because, and I get it, not, not everybody knows him like I know him. Maybe not everybody knows him like you know him. But when you know him and you have a revelation of who he is in your life, your giving is just a natural response of that. Amen? Maybe you're like Mary Magdalene, who when she came and poured out that alabaster box, she did it saying, God, you've delivered me of so much. I'm here to worship you. I'm here to give you my best. Maybe you know him like Peter, who even though he denied him three times, Jesus still restored him and forgave him and used him as the first man to preach a gospel message. Maybe you know him like Paul, who was assaulting Christians and was doing everything to defame the name of Jesus, but then he had an encounter with Jesus. Amen. He had an encounter with the head of the church and it changed his life and he gave his entire life to the gospel. I don't know how you know him and I can't speak for your experience. I can't speak for your revelation, but I can inspire you to know that your giving comes out of your revelation of him, of who he is in your life. Amen. Of who he is in your life. Do you know him as your redeemer? Do you know him as your savior? Amen? If three wise guys and their whole entourage, these three, or, you know, whatever, it's not three, it's a lot of them, whatever. But, you know, like this, this mob of wealthy, prominent, wise guys, if they can do what they did to show up and worship Jesus when he was just a little baby, just because they saw his sign, and they can go through everything they went through, and they can pour out their best gifts and honor him like a king when he was just a little baby, then how much more can you and I stand up to do whatever we have to do to worship him with our very, very best? Amen. And not, not wait for an instigation, not wait for somebody to stir us up. Not, I'm not giving based on your revelation of him. And that's where some people are at is They've heard his testimony through somebody else. They've heard about Jesus through somebody else. They have mental assent of who Jesus is. But when you encounter him for yourself, when you encounter the love of God in your life, and you start to acknowledge who he is, that he's God Almighty all by himself, and then what he's done for you in redeeming you and restoring you in, in just blessing your socks off, <laughs> you know, in all that he has done in your life, when you start to consider that, then it's like your natural response is to worship him. And when we worship, our treasure shows up. Amen? You can't separate heart and treasure. You know, and it's not, it's like, man, it's like if I took, if we took a snapshot of all of our giving individually, it's not about a, a, a one-time offering. Though th There are certain ones that are important and special and, you know, those like watermark um, those lines in the sand that you like, you know, you do something special and significant. Those, that happens. But your giving is a lifestyle of giving. Amen? It's not, it's, not, it's not what you do one time. Like some people are like, well, I was a great parent today. You know, I showed up and I fed my kids food and, you know, I tucked them in at night. I played ball with them, whatever. You know, I was a good parent today. You know, like, and they want like a, you want a cookie? <laughs> you want a pat on the back for that? Right? But it's not what you do one day out of seven, right? It's your lifestyle. It's what you do consistently that truly creates your lifestyle. So our giving is not about this like one-time occurrence. You know, it is a lifestyle of giving. It is a lifestyle of worship. It is a lifestyle of responding to his great love. A lifestyle of, of responding to the revelation of who Christ is in me. Amen? Amen? So, you know... If, if we were to take a snapshot, and I'm saying personally, this is between you and the Lord, listen. Take a snapshot of your personal giving, of your lifestyle of giving. Like, take a snapshot, a screenshot for yourself of what that looks like in your life. And ask yourself, does this snapshot of my lifestyle of giving, does it accurately represent how I honor and worship my king? And if it doesn't, then make adjustments. Amen? Let's raise this standard of our giving to truly reflect that we honor 
the Lord for who he is in our life. And listen, if you, if, if, be honest with yourself. There's no, you know, this is a no judgment zone. Be honest with yourself. If you don't know him like that yet, if you're like, Pastor Lauren, I hear you, and I want to know him like that, but I don't totally know him like that. Be honest with yourself and be honest with the Lord and say, God, I want to know you like that. I want to have that revelation of who you are. I want to encounter your love. I want to experience who you are. And he will, and that is a prayer he is very willing to answer. Amen. And let your worship come out of that place. Amen? Don't, don't let your giving be a reflection of what someone motivates you to do. Don't let your giving be a reflection of what your budget tells you is okay. Don't let your giving to the king be a reflection of um, just what you're believing for in the next, you know, 362 days of the year. Don't let your giving be a reflection of that. Let your giving be a reflection of who he is in your life. Amen? And when you do that, you can't go wrong. Interesting how, you know, when they did what they did to honor the Lord, not even fully comprehending who he was that they were honoring. Isn't it amazing how supernatural protection came in, in the way of a dream? It literally spared their life. When you choose to honor God, your life will be on the right track. Amen? When you choose to honor God and put him first place, you're going to find yourself in the will of God for your life. So many people are so afraid of missing it, you know. Oh, I'm like, just, I'm so afraid of missing it. I'm so afraid I'm going to, like, get it wrong. I'm so afraid I'm going to make a misstep. Just honor the Lord. Just put him first place, not just with your lips, but with your life. And you will have everything you need. You will have everything taken care of. The Bible says, I've never seen the righteous forsaken or their seed begging bread. So I don't make my decision in what I give or how I give in based on, you know, what I have or what my budget tells me. I give to honor the Lord. And when I do that and my heart is in it and I'm, I'm doing it with the right motive, then I know that everything I have need of will be met. Amen? Every ounce of protection I need, I've got it. I don't ever have to worry about that. Amen? And remember, it's in, it is in proportion to what you have. You know, Jesus gave a great example of that in the Bible, of the woman with the mites. And, you know, the big rich guy came in, and he was, like, making a show about, like, oh, look how much I'm giving. I'm giving so much. And then, you know, a little lady comes with her two, like, like her, little, her little pennies. And he was like, she gave more than, and the, and the disciples were like, what? What do you mean? You know, like, that's ridiculous. Because he doesn't, he's not considering the amount. Like, so many people get caught up on the amount. It's all about the proportion, right? It's all about the proportion. It's what moves your heart. What touches you? If it touches you when you give it, then it touches him when you give it. Amen? If it means something to you, it means something to him. Amen? So I just really felt to encourage you guys with that. And I encourage you, like, let, you know, let, let this be, you know, let the Lord really minister to you along these lines. And, and start seeking that, that revelation for yourself, that revelation of, Lord, I want to know who you are in my life. I, wanna, I want my worship to be a reflection of who you are in my life. Amen? Amen? So ushers, please come in and give us the opportunity to honor the Lord today. And I thank you, Lord Jesus, that this is just going to be a reflection, you know, not just today, but every day. Like, God, I mean, I'm, I'm, trust me, I'm challenged. Like, the Lord's challenging me with this to say, you know, let my lifestyle of giving truly reflect how I want to honor him. And the Bible says, you know, that he gives bread to eat and he gives seed to sow right? So there's been many times where I found myself, I'm like, God, what I have to sow is not like an, it, it doesn't feel necessarily like an accurate depiction of how I want to worship you. Has anybody ever felt like that? Like, God, you know, like this, you know, you mean so much to me. Like I'll, I could empty my bank account every single day because I love you so much. Like I, I know most of us feel like that, you know, but when your heart is in your giving and you choose to honor the Lord, there will, not, there will always be enough. And you pray for that. You pray, God, bless me with seed to sow. I thank you. I know that you give me bread to eat, but I thank you that you give me seed to sow. And you start putting your faith out there to believe God to bring treasure into your hand that you can then worship him with. Amen? You know? Like we put our faith out there for so many things. I put my faith out for a new car. I put my faith out for a new house. I put my faith out for that business. How about put your faith out for some treasure to worship the Lord with? Hey, 
How about put your faith out there for, um, you know, something that's going to build the kingdom. Amen. So as we, you know, we're going into the new year and we have all these goals and dreams and expectations and you should, you know, vision, right? But at the very forefront of that, what's driving your vision and what's driving those goals, the very first and foremost thing should be to honor the Lord. God, let every goal, let every dream that I have for this year, let it, let its main purpose be to honor you. Amen. Let that be the first thing in my life. And when you do that, listen, you cannot out give God. When you truly honor him, you're, you, you set yourself up to live a life of abundance. And the trick is to not, to not forget that. You know, a lot of times when the increase comes or people make pledges or they make covenants or whatever, and they're like, God, if you bring this into my life, I'll do this. And then it comes, and then they're like, wow, that's a lot of money. I, I, I probably would be better off investing this to make some more money, you know? No, honor your commitment to the Lord. Amen? Do what you promised him. Honor him. Say, God, you told me. I told you, if you brought me here, I would do X, Y, and Z. And now you brought me here, and I'm going to do it. A lot of people say a lot of things, but let's be people of covenant. Let's be people of commitment. Let's be people of action. Let's be people who put our treasure where our heart is. Amen? Amen? So this year, make those commitments to the Lord. I encourage you, with all the goals that you have, make, make a goal to say, God, this is how much I want to give this year to honor you to bless you. I want to, I want to go to a whole other level. If you aim for nothing, you're bound to hit it, right? So if you don't put your faith out there for anything, then you're just going to do the same old, same old, but start to believe God for such increase and, 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 and creative ways and new streams of income and other channels by which you can honor the Lord. Amen. By which you can bless him. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, the ushers are going to come, and as they do, I want you guys to just stand to your feet. We're gonna, there's a song they're going to play. If y'all will play that song, um, it's a very simple song, and, you know, and I just encourage you as, you, as you give today, remember, it's worship. Worship the Lord. Say, God, I release this into your hands, and it's to honor you. It is to worship you. Amen? Thank you, Jesus. Y'all can lower the lights a little, little bit. Ooh, thank you, Jesus. Jesus, how's everybody doing? You love Jesus? Everybody just lift your hands right now and say, Father, I thank you, Lord, for your precious Holy Spirit. Lord, thank you for providing for me, Lord. So today I worship you, Lord, with my substance. Father, I know you're the one that empowers me with the grace to create wealth. 
In Jesus' name. Let me say, in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, you may be seated. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for that smooth fade on the music. Appreciate it. <laughs> How's everybody doing? How many of you guys had an awesome New Year's? Awesome Christmas? Man, we had, some, we had a pretty good fireworks show. Oh, God, who enjoyed that? That was pretty ridiculous. All right. All right. Well, today I want to talk about being efficient and being effective. Amen? I've been actually talking about this. It's funny because when something's like rolling around in my spirit, I tend to talk about it everywhere I go. Like I meet with people and talk about it. And that's the way the Lord deals with us. Amen? So one of the things before I get started... I want to talk about getting into the Word of God. Amen? How, well, I'm not going to ask the question. <laughs> How many of you are reading your Bible? You can't lie in church. <laughs> like, dang, put me on the spot. Um, <laughs> so there's a reason why some people press into the Word and others don't. Amen? So today I'm going to talk about that a little bit because you're not going to grow unless you get into the Word. Amen? You got to get into the Word. And some people struggle to get into the Word. And part of the reason why people struggle to get into the Word is, let's go to Romans chapter, let's see, let's see, maybe 8 or 7 first, let me see. I'm going to go, let's go, oh, if my iPad, did my iPad just die on me? Yeah, this thing just died on me. Well, it just reset itself. Well, we got a backup. Wow. <laughs> Technology. Hopefully, after today, you will not struggle any longer in reading the Bible. How about that? Amen. Because you're not going to grow if you don't read the Word. And a lot of times people don't talk about these practical things, but they're super important. Like, it's good you come to church. It's good you listen to preaching. But if we can't get you in the Word and we can't get the Word in you, Sundays is not going to be enough. Can I get an amen? amen. It's not going to be enough. Let's go to Romans chapter 7. Amen. <clears throat> I got so many scriptures today. You know what? Let's go. Let's go to eight. Let's go to eight. You can read seven. You can read seven at home. All right. We're going to read from the top. There's, there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Anybody in Christ Jesus? Can I get a loud amen? amen. Who do not walk according to the flesh. Now, that's very interesting because a lot of people say, um, you know, when you, when you try to set a standard, right, or hold people to a Christian standard, right, and that person's living in sin, what's the first thing that person tells you? Oh, don't condemn me, bro, you know? You can't condemn me, right? So people are always very defensive when you raise a standard about Christianity and you're telling people to walk in their inheritance, amen, to be a true Christian, amen, to stop, you know, basically when you're holding somebody accountable to stop being a hypocrite, right, one of the first things they used to try to defend themselves is, well, you can't condemn me. You can't, you can't condemn me because I'm born again, right? I'm not, I'm not to be condemned, right? And a lot of people use that kind of to defend or justify their, their, not, you know, their iniquity or their, you know, um, their poor lifestyle or whatever it is, right? Anybody heard of that, right? We all have, right? So now, where does it say here in the Bible to whom is there no condemnation? Okay, a little bit more specific. It's right there. To who is there no condemnation? Those who are in Christ Jesus, but it's right there. I'm going to give it to you. Who do not walk according to the flesh. Amen? Interesting, right? It's right there. It's an open book. Test. Amen. Look at this. 
Everybody say, look at this. There is therefore now no condemnation to who? Because everybody wants to claim that there's no condemnation, right? So the Bible has a way of sifting out the real from the fake. Amen? And you need to be able to do that so that you know who everybody is, and you need to be able to do that in your life so that you can be honest about your location. Amen? So you can kind of allocate where you are at. Amen? How many of you guys think that's important? So I say a lot, of, a lot of times, you know, you go on Google Maps, and anytime you're going to go put in an address or look for a restaurant, the very first thing you do, here I'm going to give you an example, illustrate the sermon. So we got Google Maps, and you hit that little circle, right? Boom, there it is. There I, it just found me. Isn't that amazing? You just press that button and bam, there I am. Look at that. Oh, look. Whoa, whoa. Amazing technology, right? So that's what the Word of God is going to do for you, amen? If you don't get into the Word, you're never going to know where you're at. Amen? And if you don't know where you're at, you're susceptible to deception. You're susceptible to justifying maybe being in a really bad situation. Is that true? So the Bible says that it's the word, the truth of God's word that makes you free. Amen? Well, this is the situation you have to understand. It not only makes you free, but it keeps you free. Everybody say the truth keeps me free. So how do you know whether you're free at any moment in, in, in life if you're in the word? Now let, me say, let, now let me say this. If you're outside of the word for a long period of time, how do you know that you're not being deceived? How do you know that you're living in the truth if the truth is not in you? Amen? So you've got to understand that God's word is where everything begins. Amen? He watches over what? To perform it. Amen? So how many guys want God to perform in your life? Some people talk, you know, last week I shared a very strong message about people questioning God's performance. Is that true? How people love to question God's performance, right? And how we're never to do that, right? Because God's word is true, amen? And God's word is what? Yes and amen. Amen? Come on. And we know that he never misses the mark. Amen? Does God miss the mark? Do we miss the mark? So why do we question God so much? Why, you know, so, you know, last week I was talking about people being offended at God. I had a, liter a lady come to me after service. She's a minister her whole life. Went to Bible school, this whole, you know, woman of God. And she came to me and she was like, man, I really need to hear this message because I feel like layers of offenses were pulled back. Amen? And you know why? Because it's exactly what I said. I even said it during the message. I said, people walk their Christianity 5, 10, 15 years, and they have this book called the Book of Opinions where they're recording people's shipwrecked experiences. Come on, somebody. People's faith shipwrecked experiences, and they record all these things. Well, you know, Sally, she had cancer, and we believe God, and we don't know what happened. Amen? It's amazing how you don't know what happened when you don't read God's Word. But when you read God's word, you know exactly what happens. And it makes you accountable, not to me, but it makes you accountable to the word. Is that true? Because the Bible does paint a clear picture, and I'm not going to go over it again. If you want the cliff notes, just go back and read, go back and listen to um, um, Sunday's message last week. We talked about how there are people in the faith that stand firm, and there are people in the faith that do what? That waver. Amen? And what does the Bible say about the people that waver? Back and forth. They're tossed like a wave back and forth. Amen? Anybody know the scripture that we shared last week? James? Chapter what? what was it? Chapter 3? Chapter 1. It was chapter 1. There you go. You were, you were listening. Brett's the pastor. You better be listening. Okay. Just kidding. <laughs> so, amen. So, did you go back and read it? The Bible says that a double-minded man is guaranteed to get what? Oh, wait. So the problem is preachers don't teach that to the people. Amen? So then when people, 
When, when people don't have their prayers answered because they don't know the truth, they begin to blame God. Well, you know, God came through for uh, Kyler, but he didn't come through for me. Where is God? Amen? So, but they never ask, where am I? Amen? Because I'm perfect. I'm, you know, I do everything right. Amen? My faith and th- my integrity is never to be questioned. But God, you know, he's up, he, you know, he's up for debate. Amen? So if you have that kind of faith, you're never going to see miracles. Amen? The type of people that see miracles are people that stand on God's word and don't have any excuses. Amen? I don't have any excuses. If I don't get a miracle, then I'm wavering. There's some doubt. Amen? What happens when the disciples didn't receive their miracles? What did Jesus tell the disciples? Pray for what? He prayed for their what? Their unbelief. When the disciples came back and they said, you know, hey, we tried this. You know, you gave us your name to perform miracles. You gave us this authority, and it worked, but then we tried it over here, and it didn't work, right? Come on, somebody. We tried it with the boy. It didn't work. So when you look at the different translations, every single time that the disciples came and they did not get what they wanted, Jesus challenged them about their unbelief and prayed for their unbelief. Is that true? Come on, somebody. So why is it that we have so many people pointing the finger at God? Isn't it self, so self-righteous of man to point the finger at God? Don't do that, amen? That's called pride. If you are questioning God, it's pride. Who, who, who am I, a, a mere man, to question God's integrity? Who are you to question God's integrity? That's a good word, that's a good word amen? That's, that's a good thing to think about. The problem is, in our modern times, people do not have an honest fear of God. Amen? There's no reverence. Amen? There's no fear of God. So people can easily point their finger. Because we prayed, we fasted, we, you know, whatever. You know, I use my prayer bracelet. My God. Every stone represents a prayer. I mean, I'm telling you right now, I went through it five times every day. Don't know what happened with Jesus. He didn't show up. Where's the prayer bracelet in the Bible? Are you, I mean, we have all these trinkets and the five ways to the two ways and the tape series and this and that. None of that stuff is going to supplement a relationship with the Holy Ghost and you reading your Bible. Come on, somebody. It's like Christian tarot cards. You know, I'm just telling you, it's mysticism. It's not even the Bible. Hello? How about we just, how about we just go old school and just do what Jesus told us to do? Amen? My God, I think it would work a whole lot better. Are you listening to me? So forget about the prayer bracelet and the this and the that. And whatever, and all the trinkets. I'm not saying, look, you can have a strategy or whatever. But none of this stuff supplements just getting in the word. Amen? If you are stable and grounded in your faith, that man will receive what he asked the Lord. If you're unstable and wavering in your faith, the Bible says that man will not receive anything from the Lord. It's as simple as that. Amen? So you got to, so that puts the ball in your court. Amen? If I level up my measure of faith, amen, I could believe for this, and I, I believe for that, and we break through in this area, and then we can believe for bigger things, amen? Come on, somebody. The Bible says we grow from what? From glory to glory, amen? But you got to use your faith, amen? Look at this. Now there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. It's funny. I say it like I said it brand new, right? It's like I said it for the very first time, right? Look. So I'm, look, all right, let, let's go back here a little bit. I'm trying to get you to read the Bible a little differently, amen? See, I mean, I can spend 15 minutes on one verse, amen? Come on, somebody. There's me in the Word, amen? So read things and reread them and read them from different angles and stop reading it from the same perspective every single time. Try to get the mind of Christ on things, amen? Get in the Holy Ghost, amen? amen. So people will read the, over this and they glance over so much. 
the Bible's telling us now there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You're like, I understand that, but do you really understand that? Amen? And this is what I mean by that. What I mean by that is there's no condemnation for people that are truly in Christ Jesus, not people that claim to be in Christ Jesus. Amen? Is it talking about real Christians or fake Christians? I believe it's talking about the real Christians. Amen? So when somebody says to you, you can't judge me, and we're not, it's not that we're judging people, we're allowed to judge their fruit. So when people say don't judge, well, hold on a minute. Don't judge what? Because you got to read the entirety of the Bible. You cannot judge a man's soul to condemn them to go to hell because God is the one that, that, that is over a man's soul. Amen? For their salvation. Is that true? But we are called to judge people's works. Amen? Their fruit. Amen? We are called to examine people's lives according to Scripture. Is that true? So it seems funny to me that the people that are always claiming, oh, don't judge me, don't judge me, are the ones that are always in sin. Amen? Isn't that, isn't that amazing how that works? Now, to clarify the point that I just made, because Scripture always confirms Scripture, amen? I said we're talking about real Christians. Is that what I, is that what I said? All right, let's read it again. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Bible, please clarify, and it will. Who are these real Christians? What do they do? They don't what? Come on, people. Do you see how much, it, you see how much is in there? But we glance over it. And we allow people to come to try to justify themselves in this altered Christianity that's not really Christianity. Are you listening to me? Isn't it amazing? Right? Interesting. Who are these people that are in Christ Jesus? Who are they? They're the type of people that don't walk according to the flesh. Amen? Let me ask you this. Can you call yourself a Christian if you walk according to the flesh? The Bible says if you walk according to the flesh, you will not fulfill the what? The desires of the spirit, right? If you walk according to the flesh, you fulfill the desires of the flesh. We are called to walk according to the spirit. Amen? So what does it mean to be a Christian? What it means to be a Christian is, is that your flesh walk stops. Amen? Your old fleshly works stop. Behold, you're a new creation in Christ Jesus, and now you are empowered by the Holy Ghost to walk by the Spirit of God. Can I get an amen? amen? Not in your own strength, but in God's grace, in God's strength, you walk in the Spirit. Is that true? Is it God that empowers you to walk in the Spirit? Yes. So if it's God empowering you and giving you the energy, amen, and the power to walk in His Spirit, when you do something, who's doing it? God's doing it through you. That's why we give them the glory. Is that true? That's why as a believer, anything you do, you do it unto the Lord because he's empowering you to do it. Is that true? Come on, somebody. Give Jesus a clap in this place. That's what it means to be a Christian. What it means to be a Christian, it means to be a spiritual man. What a basic concept. Amen? But if I don't explain it and break it down, it gets so diluted. We're called to be spiritual. Yeah, everybody knows that, but nobody knows what it, nobody knows how to actually do it. Nobody's actually, few people are actually walking in the spirit. Amen? You're called to walk by the spirit. And when you walk by the spirit, what does the Bible say? When you walk by the spirit, what's the fruit of that? You don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. When you walk by the spirit, you don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. What does that mean? That means as a Christian, it's not about trying to stop sinning. If, as a Christian, your goal is to stop sinning, you will never stop sinning. Because that's not the way you stop sinning. The way you stop sinning is you begin to walk in the Spirit. Come on, somebody. And then when you begin to walk in the Spirit and you renew your mind with the Word of God, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Can I get an amen? So sin is not your obstacle because sin has been conquered at the cross. Come on, somebody. Come on, give Jesus a... 
Sin has no longer got a hold on you because it was conquered 2,000 year, two years ago at Calvary's cross. Can I get a big amen? amen. Everybody say sin, sin is no longer my problem. What you think is your problem is not your problem. Actually, your problem is, is that you're too sin-focused. And what the enemy will do to cause you to stop walking in the Spirit or to even not walk in the Spirit is have you focus on your sin. Because as long as you focus on your sin, you're condemning yourself. Are you listening to me? And if you are condemned, then you're not redeemed. The only way to be redeemed is if the cross was enough for you. Now, that's a good question, amen? Was the cross enough for me? Are you listening to me? Was the shed blood at Calvary enough for me? It is enough for me. Now, is it enough for you? Come on, somebody. Was the cross enough for you? So sin has no longer got a hold on you. You've got to believe this, amen? Amen. But what happens is people get saved and the enemy makes them so sin focused that everything becomes about trying to stop the sin. And you're never going to stop sinning that way. What are you telling me, Pastor Alec? What I'm telling you is to stop focusing on your sin. Your sin will be dissolved when you learn how to walk by the Spirit. Come on, somebody. The Spirit is the eradicator of the flesh. When you walk by the Spirit, you fulfill the things of the spirit. Amen? Amen? When you walk by the flesh, you fulfill the things of the flesh. So there is no condemnation to the person that does not walk according to the flesh. Again, what does that mean, pastor? There's no condemnation because sin has no hold on you, my friend, when you walk by the spirit. Amen? I don't care what your problem is. People think they have all these big problems. You don't have a problem that Jesus can't solve. You really don't have a sin problem. You have a, you have a walking in your flesh problem. And we need to eradicate the walking in the flesh. And when you eradicate the walking in the flesh and you begin to actually walk by the Spirit, all of your sin and your sinful deeds and your sinful problems and your bondages will dissolve away by the power of the Holy Ghost. Can I get an amen? We focus on the cross. We focus on what Jesus did 2,000 years ago. We focus on the fact that the old man is dead, and we believe that. Can I get an amen? Do you believe the old man is dead? Then why you talk about him all the time? Why are you wrestling with him? Why are you struggling with him? Amen? Put him away. Amen? And take on Christ. I am not a carnal man. I am a spiritual man. That is a very good confession for you to make. I constantly do it all the time. Everybody say, I am a spiritual man, a spiritual woman, if you're a spiritual woman. I am a spiritual creature. Amen. Yeah. You know, it's amazing. It's amazing to me how ahead of the time the Bible was. I mean, the Bible was like way ahead of its time. You know, because when the Bible says, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel, it doesn't say preach the gospel to every man and woman. It says, Preach the gospel to every creature. Because God knew that in 2022, you were going to have people that claim to be cats and dogs. And my God, who knows what else people claim to be. And the Lord's like, you know what? I know what you guys are going to do, so got them. Every creature. <laughs> Everybody's included, my God. You little purple unicorn, you, you my God, will get you... We'll, get, we'll cast that devil right out of you, my God. There's no problem. We've taken unicorns in the altar, cats, dogs, whatever. You claim to be Superman. Everybody knows you're not, but it's okay. Got him. Every creature. It's all good, but by the time we're done with you, you're not going to be a creature anymore. Amen? We'll convert you into a man and a woman back. Amen? Come on, somebody. Everybody say every creature. Every creepy thing that crawls on the earth. <laughs> oh, that's funny. I, I really, I don't know. I really do feel like that was on purpose. It's like, could you imagine like, like 2,000 years ago, you know, they were writing the thing. <laughs> These guys. 
They don't even know. We're, f- <laughs> we're like, we're going to 4D this thing. So to whom is there no condemnation? To the people that walk by the Spirit. Dang, Pastor, you mean that you mean that I have to be born again and I have to be a spiritual person? Yeah. <laughs> what a concept. Man, I thought I could just pray a prayer and just continue to walk in the flesh. No. That means you're not born again. Where, let me ask you this, where are you born again? What was dead before you were born again? Your spirit, man, was made alive in Christ. For what? So that you could walk by the spirit. That's the whole purpose of Christianity. The whole purpose of Christianity is to get you to walk by the spirit. That's the whole purpose of it. Is to get you to get back what Adam lost. Amen, at the garden. Adam was a spiritual man, and he became a fleshly man through the curse of sin. Is that true? And that curse of sin brings a reproach. Amen? It brings a curse. And you have been redeemed from the curse of sin. To walk back into the spirit where man was originally designed to do. Come on, can I get an amen? That is Christianity. You know what's a good way to put it? Man, this is a really good way to put it. My God. You ready for this? Man, that's a good way to put it. Christianity is for people that want to walk in the Spirit. That's it. You cannot be a Christian if you don't want to walk in the Spirit. You are not a Christian if you don't walk in the Spirit. You are regenerated for the purpose of walking in the Spirit. There's a great scripture that summarizes this. And that scripture basically is, if you walk, if you walk after, well, before I get to that, let me read this really quick. Let me read this. Look at this. I'm going to finish this. Because I don't want to get into that thought. Everybody say Romans chapter 8 verse 1. Because this is going to hit home. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Who do not walk according to the flesh. But according to the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life is Christ Jesus. Has made us free from the law of sin and death. So check this out. What has made us free from the law of sin of death? The spirit of life. Amen. The law of the spirit. Everybody say the law of the spirit. spirit. So you're regenerated in your spirit, man, to walk in the spirit. This law supersedes the law of sin and death. Amen. That happens when, what, what happens is when you're reborn into a spiritual man and you walk in the spirit, As a spiritual man, you dominate the law of sin and death. Come on, somebody. So you know, remember how I told you, don't focus on the law of sin and death. If all your focus is to try to dominate and conquer the law of sin and death without being a spiritual man, it's never going to happen. Because the way it happens is this law is conquered by the spirit of life. Amen? When you walk in the spirit of life, That is what dominates and conquers the law of sin and death in your life. So sin and death will be eradicated when you walk by the Spirit. Can I get a big amen? Amen. Do you see it? Everybody say, I don't have a problem with sin. Stop confessing and stop believing the lie that you have a problem with sin. Well, I got a problem with pornography. I got a problem with this. I got a problem with gossiping. I got a, uh, I'm pessimistic. I'm depressed. I'm, 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 I'm. I thought... When you were born again, the Bible says, behold, all the old things have passed away, and now you're a new creation in Christ Jesus. So let me ask you this. When are you going to begin to believe that? 
You know what's a good question to ask people? And I'm trying to get you to think today. A good question to ask people is, if you don't believe, if you don't believe that you're born again, are you born again? It's a crazy question to ask. Amen? It's, a, it's, like the, it's like the stupidest question to ask, right? Man, if I don't believe I'm born again, am I born again? Well, how can you believe that you're born again if all the old things have not passed away? Amen? That's the whole premise of being born again. That you have to believe that all the old things, all the sin, every weakness, everything that is attached to your flesh has been dealt with at the cross. Come on, that is the whole premise of salvation. Can I get an amen? You know why people don't give God praise? Amen? You know what's something in society that people don't understand? And I know I'm bouncing around here, but I'm getting you to think today. How many of you guys have ever heard of praise and worship? Right? Well, in America, praise, right, is a segment that we have, right? You know the praise songs, right? What's the difference between a praise song and a worship song? Praise is like, you know, where people are like kind of get loud and hyped up, right? Right? And then the worship is where everybody cries and, you know, whatever, right? Well, let me ask you this. Why is it that in America praise sucks so much? And I'll tell you this. In most churches, praise sucks. I'm just going to tell you straight up. I mean, it just sucks. Amen? Look, we're believe- look, Pastor Josh is doing a great job. I'm not talking about this church. <laughs> but every, every, everything has a starting point, and we're going to continue to grow. Amen? And I'm patient. It's all good. Amen? Listen. <laughs> and I'm honest. Look, to be honest with you, Pastor Josh is stepping into this role, but this is, that's not like what he's called to do, and he's a great singer. Amen? Come on, give Pastor Josh. But I'm just going to tell you, one day the, whole, the praise in this church is going to look a whole lot different. But let's talk about praise for, uh, 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 you know, you could say, look, we could say this. We can have a leadership meeting board meeting, whatever meeting you want. Man, how are we going to make the praise better? Let's all get together. Pastor Josh, you know what? Let's, let's see how we're going to get these Americans to praise. And um, man, how do we make it more lively? Praise God. Well, you know what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to um, put some laser lights. Yeah. Yeah. And then what we're going to do is we're going to get like kind of like a stroby light that strobes with the bass line. Like bump, 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 bump. Okay, people are like, oh, okay, well, okay. And, and, and then we're going to get the music at about 115 decibels. Yeah. And then we're going to get some cool looking guys with ripped up jeans. And they're going to be bouncing on the stage. Synchronized. Y'all ready to worship Jesus? What is this like? Uh, I don't know. And everybody's like, uh, yeah, I think so. Are we in a club or is this, is this church? I mean, I, yeah, I think I could do this. So it's like, you know, it's like you got to work the thing, you know. You really got to work it to try to get people to praise. Why is that? Right? Now, I'm going to say this. There's a reason why praise lacks in people's lives. And it's not the laser light show. And it's not the freaking hipster guy with the ripped jeans. Amen? And it's not any of that stuff. The reason why the church has to do all that stuff 
is because praise is not on people's lips. And the reason why praise is not on people's lips is because they have nothing to be thankful for. Because they don't actually believe that their sins are forgiven. I'm just telling you right now. Because when you believe that your sins are forgiven and that your past is your past, now you have something to give them praise for. Can I get an amen in this church? Are you listening to me? And when you know that you have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, praise will be in your lips when you're driving down the road. My God, Lord, I praise you. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Shaka Bro Sandy. You know what I'm talking about? You give them praise. Ain't nobody got to work you up to praise Jesus. My God, my, lo- my soul longs for thee. Thank you, Jesus, the Redeemer of my soul. I feel the Holy Ghost in this place. You see, praise lacks on your tongue because you don't know what you've been redeemed from. Because when you get a revelation of what you've been redeemed from, that's the place that praise comes from. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I am redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Oh, Lord, I praise you. Oh, I give you praise, Jesus. Oh, I give you praise, God. You're so awesome. Why is praise lacking from the American church? Because people have not fallen in love with Jesus. So when you haven't fallen in love with Jesus, you got to put up, you got to put up the smoke show, the light show, the laser. You got to do all these things, and even with all these things, it's still kind of like meh. You know what I'm talking about? Justin Bieber comes on stage. <laughs> Steph Curry hits a three. <laughs> Everybody gets excited about all this stuff. How about getting excited about the redeemer of your soul? The problem is if you don't really believe he's redeemed your soul, nothing to be excited from. But when I know he's the redeemer of my soul, when I know he's the one that watches over me and keeps me, when I know he's the one that gives me the wisdom and the grace to do life, when I know that he's the one that gives me the love to love my wife, to love my children, come on, somebody, I'm going to give him praise. And everybody that knows me knows I don't care about anything if it's not hooked up to Jesus. I don't care about anything. The only thing I care about is doing what God's called me to do. Everybody can do whatever they're going to do. And most people do nothing and criticize others that do something. So what am I going to do, pay attention to them? No, I'm going to serve God with all my heart. And let heaven keep record. And when we show up to heaven, we'll see who's who and what's what. Because everybody can talk all they want. Amen. But at the end of the day, there's got to be fruit for your life. And if there's no fruit, are you really a Christian? Come on, somebody. I'm going to serve God. Do you have any questions about that? No. Are you going to serve God with everything that is in you? Serve the Lord. Amen? People don't serve God because they don't know who he is. When you get to know him and you know and you begin to know who he is, you begin to fear him and respect him. And reverence him for who he is. But if you don't know who he is, you won't reverence him. You won't respect him and you won't fear him. And you'll be blasé about God because you don't know him, my friend. But when you know him and you get to know him, my God, all you want to do is, Lord, how can I do better? How can I serve you more? How can I be more sold out? Amen? When you get a revelation about what he did for you at, the, at Calvary's cross, when you get a revelation of that, then maybe we can, maybe, just maybe, if we, if, if we can get you to get a revelation of what he did for you at the cross, maybe, just maybe, maybe, not too sure, maybe, we can get you to get up off your seat and lift your hands and give him praise. Maybe. Not guaranteed, but maybe. You, you understand what I'm saying? The problem with the church and Christians is that they don't know who they serve. They have not got to know him. They've not spent time with him. Are you listening to me? They don't know who the alpha and the omega is. They can say it, but they don't know it. And when you know it, my friend, you know it. And you begin to reverence God. Amen? Why do I, why do I strive to have good character and integrity? And I preach so much about character and integrity. Because I know that heaven is watching. Are you listening to me? And I, and I look, and my aim 
Do not ever get it twisted. My aim is only to please God. I don't care what anybody says. Have never. And anybody that knows me intimately knows that's the truth. I'm not trying to talk anybody into them thinking that I'm a nice guy. Because my goal in life is not to be a nice guy. It's not to be a bad guy. It's not to be a happy guy or this guy. It's to be a man of God. That's my objective in life. My objective in life is to be esteemed of heaven, not of men. Men can say whatever they want. If your aim is to please people, you're never going to please everybody anyways. Is that true? I can aim to please this four, and then another four will hate me. So who cares? I don't care. I don't get distracted. Look, one thing I found out that is true in life is that everybody lives in their own reality. Are you listening to me? Everybody lives like in their own altered reality that they've created for themselves. And they have layers of justification and lies and all kinds of things that keep them in this program, this altered reality. Do you understand what I'm saying? And you get, and you get around people and their reality, and you're like, kunk, kunk, kunk. How do I get them out? I can't get them out. But I know one that can, and his name is Jesus. Amen? Is your reality real? What you believe about life, the way you conduct yourself, is that really reality? Or are you living some altered reality that the devil has made for you to keep you bound, to keep you from recognizing your gifts and your calls, to steal, kill, and rob and destroy you? Are you listening to me? To keep you on the sidelines, never to realize what God has put you on this earth for. Are you listening to me? You understand what I'm saying? The only thing that's going to break you out of this altered reality is the truth of God's word. And it's Jesus. You've got to invite him in your heart. But you have to follow him. A prerequisite for receiving Jesus is following him. You can't claim to receive Jesus and then go your own way. You never received him. He's going to say in that day, depart from me. I never knew you. You worker of iniquity. What does that mean? It's all written. It's all written there in the record. And that record will be used against you if you don't follow it. But it's there. Are you listening to me? And if you pay attention, you'll pick it up really quick. Amen? Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. You know what that means in the modern day vernacular? Depart from me. You never did my works. You never followed me. Iniquity means you do your own will. Depart from me. You never did my will. I never knew you. He's, the Bible says we are the vine. He's the branches. We are connected to the vine to produce fruit. That is the purpose you're connected. And the only way you're going to produce fruit is if you put away the old man and you allow the new spiritual man to come and empower you to be like Jesus. You can't be like Jesus. You can't talk like Jesus. You can't touch like Jesus. But when Jesus comes on the inside of you, you can touch like Jesus. You can talk like Jesus. You can walk like Jesus. Can I get a big amen? amen. Come on, somebody. Amen. Jesus, Jesus, I'm going to tell you right now, for everybody that's in this place to listen to what I'm saying. Listen to what I'm saying. And this will ring true in eternity. And this will be held against you in eternity. Jesus is not a get out of hell free card. Are you listening to me, my friend? Many will be surprised on that day. I'm, I'm telling you by the Holy Ghost. Jesus is not a get out of hell free card. And anybody that, receive, that receives Jesus on that premise will be surprised on judgment day. Jesus is the regenerator of your soul. Amen. He's the forgiver of your sins. He's the friend that sticks closer than a brother. That's Jesus. If you receive that Jesus, you'll make it into heaven. But the apostle Paul told the Galatians, who has bewitched you and preached to you another Jesus? There's a lot of flavors of Jesus. But not everybody that calls his name on that day will go in. And the Bible tells us this. What? So what am I, let me break it down. What are you telling me, Pastor Alex? You're telling me 
that when I receive Jesus, I really honestly have to mean it and follow it? Wow, what a concept. Think about that. I thought I could just quote a couple of scriptures and just carry on. Well, you were wrong, my friend. That's not Christianity. Amen? Christianity is come follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. Come on, somebody. What? Look, I don't understand. One of my biggest questions in life is this. I don't understand this. I might never understand it. God's given me wisdom in a lot of areas in life. But this one, I don't understand. Why is it so hard for people to give up their life after the flesh? I don't understand it. Amen? There's no question in my mind that Jesus laid down his life for you. Is that true? Why won't you lay down your life for him? That's the question. That I, I might never, I don't think I'll ever be able to answer that one. No, I'm, no, I'm just going to do my own thing. You never received them, my friend. Why, why is it so difficult? Ask yourself that. Why is it so difficult for me to lay down my life after the flesh? Lay it down. Why is it so difficult? I don't know. I don't know. For me, once I knew Jesus was real, it was over. Amen? I, look, it took a while for me to change, but God was very patient with me. And I love Jesus from the beginning. Amen? From the beginning. When I, how many guys remember the, remember the first time? I'm not talking about the first time you felt some goosebumps or like, oh, was that the air conditioner? It blew in my ear. Oh, my God. No, no, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the first time you were overwhelmed with God's love or you knew that it was God because you never experienced anything like that in your life. There's no touch like the touch of God. And if you said, well, Pastor Alex, I think I felt that you never did. Obviously, you never did. Because when God touches you, you don't think he touches you. You know about it. Amen? This book of the Bible is written about testimonies and story, men after men, talking about their experience with God. Are you listening to me? Is that true? When these men, when these men encountered God, amen, were they at home drinking a coffee, you know, just, yeah, man. Hey, bro, I think I just experienced God's love. Huh? Is that who we're talking about? Amen? People like chewing gum. Yeah, you know, I think uh, I'm experiencing God right now. Are you listening to me? No. When you experience God, you're going to know all about it. You'll have a testimony, and you'll tell others about it. Amen? Are you listening to me? So when you encounter God, did you fall in love with him? How many of you guys fell in love with him the first time? I remember the first time I got touched. Amen? People chase after many things. They chase after doctrines. They chase after the church, social clubs, whatever, blah, 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 blah. But who are really hungering and thirsting after him, after righteousness. Amen? I'm just going to tell you, my friend, God's not that difficult to get a hold of. He's really not. And the only reason you haven't got a hold of him, anybody want to know the only reason they haven't got a hold of God? Is because you're indifferent. And you have to humble yourself. Man has to humble himself. Amen? Under the mighty hand of God. And when you humble yourself, God will come straight into your heart. And you're going to have a story to tell. Can I get a big amen? amen. Come on, somebody. Right. This is the gospel. Jesus is alive. Right. Amen? amen? 
This is not a Cinderella Pinocchio story we're talking about here. We're talking about God. The God that touched me that Sunday at a Baptist church that did not believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. People want to talk about doctrines and denominations and all this stuff. Man, you get a whole, you get real with God, God will come and touch you. I'm sitting in a Baptist church as a teenager with my Timberlands on, my big old baggy Peppa jeans, and some shirt that was probably three sizes bigger than mine, and a blowout. Wondering if God was really real. And this little farmer from the mountains of Puerto Rico, this very old man, we call him Mahibarito. He was like an old preacher. He came, in, he came that day to that Baptist church. And here I am, a, a break dancer, a basketball player. All I cared about was street racing. And I'm sitting in the service wondering, I, look, I'm not sure if God, this whole thing is real. But when this man preached, he preached with conviction. And there was something about him. I said, you know what? I've heard a lot of preachers. Never heard anybody like this man. And the guy was in his 70s. Very old man. I should have never listened to him. You, you know what I'm saying? In the natural. But I could hear Jesus in his voice. Pricking my heart. And I felt like he was talking to me the whole time. And that day he made an altar call. And I want to tell you something about an altar call. God watches an altar call. People, you know, you do an altar call, and people are like, oh, my God. <sighs> What's making you do that? The same devil that's got a hold of your soul is the one that's making you do that. That pride that's on the inside of you. Oh, no, I can't. I can't humble myself. The Bible says, if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my angels in heaven. Now, I'm a young man in this Baptist church. The Baptist church was a very traditional church. And every Sunday, nobody went to the altar call. Because people thought, if you go to the altar call, people are going to gossip about you. Oh, yeah, you know, I'm not going to go. Everybody's going to think you're a sinner, whatever. You understand what I'm saying? Very traditional church. That day, when I heard Jesus in that man's voice... And that altar call was made. My heart was beating, and I was the first one to get up. I responded to God's presence. Are you listening to me? And I went on that altar call, and I didn't know what was going to happen. And I'm telling you, my friend, that day, that day Jesus became real to me. And I've never, never in my life doubted what happened in that day. And I've never gotten over what happened that day. This was years ago, my friend. And I remember it like it was yesterday. I met Jesus for the very first time. I felt love that I did not even know existed. Are you listening to me? And I have not recovered from that encounter that I had with Jesus that day. Have never recovered from it. Never. That's Jesus, my friend. That's a conversion. You know what, you know what I did when I, when I felt Jesus for the very first time? I began to yell at the top of my lungs, crying. Wow, he's really real. I couldn't believe that God was real. I was like, wow, he's really real. And I'm yelling at the top of my lungs. And all the deacons, they come to me because it's a Baptist church, and they're all nervous, and they're trying to get me, hey, quiet, quiet down, quiet down. He's really real. Jesus is real. And I had prayed weeks before that. I said, God, if you're really real, I said, look, I'm sick of praying to the wall, praying to thin air. I read my Bible on occasion. God, if you're really real, I said, you reveal yourself to me, and I will follow you all the days of my life. And he answered my cry, and he came into my heart. And I've never been the same. I didn't change overnight, but one thing I didn't, one thing I never doubted was God's love for me and the reality of Jesus How do you go? Listen to me. You've heard my story, and you'll hear it again many times, but it's my testimony, and it's to inspire you. How do you go from listening to Tupac 
in Bone Thugs and Harmony and Outcasts to locking yourself in the room to listen to Michael W. Smith. How do you do that without nobody telling you to do that? For hours, crying, weeping in God's presence. I fell in love with Jesus. I found something. My God, I never found anything like Jesus. And to this day, I've never found anything like Jesus. He's the lover of my soul. I love Jesus with everything on the inside of me. Everything good in my life comes from Jesus. Everything. I fell in love with Jesus. I didn't know how I was going to change. I didn't care about anything. At the time, we had a big car club. We'd go street racing every night. Some nights, I'm Ricky, I'm not going. Why? I'm locking myself in my room. To put on a tape and to rewind it for hours to sing the same song over and over and over and over again, cry my eyes out because I love Jesus and I can't explain it. That's why I love Jesus. I never wanted to go in the ministry. I didn't care about the ministry. I just love Jesus. This is my story. This is what happened to me. I didn't have a pastor calling me. Nobody discipling me. Are you going to worship? Are you going to read your Bible? I would literally lock myself for hours, for hours, for years, writing down notes, reading my Bible, weeping. Did I change overnight? I didn't change overnight. I still had issues, but he was patient with me. Amen? He was so gracious and merciful. When I, mess, when I would mess up, I would crawl back into my prayer time. Lord, I messed up. I don't think I could do this and just weep my eyes out. And he would come and comfort me. No, my son, you can do it. I've called you to do great things. God, how are you going to use somebody like me? Seriously, I just want to slap somebody sometimes, God. I have too much of an anger problem. How are you going to use somebody like me? Are you listening to me? He's like, I'm sick and tired of these people compromising my word. I need somebody strong that will stand up for the truth. Will you do it? I said, yes, Lord, I'll do it. This is my story. This is how I fell in love with Jesus. This is why I love God. I'll do anything he tells me to do. This is why I gave up everything, sold everything, packed up my family, and moved to Africa with no return ticket because, God, if that's what you want me to do, I'll do it for you. When I came to Africa, God spoke to me and he said, I don't want you preaching in the city and all the big churches. I want you in the township with the humble and the broken and the poor. And I told the people, I want to go in the townships with the humble and the broken and the poor. And they said, you're an American. Are you crazy? You can't take your wife in those townships. They will rape her and kill you. I said, that's what God told me to do, and that's what I'm going to do. If it costs me my life, so be it. This is my story. You think I care what anybody thinks? I've risked my life. i put my life, my wife's life on the line for the gospel. And I'll do it again and again and again because I'll do anything he tells me to do because my life is not my own. And I'm in this. And I'm about this. Just like I was willing. When I was in the world, I was willing to give my life over a stupid argument to prove to somebody that I was a man. You think I'm not going to lay down my life for Jesus now? Like I said, let everybody do whatever they're going to do. I've made up my mind. I'm going to serve God. In those years, in those townships, with those humble and broken people, the best years of my life, and I've never experienced God's love more than just reaching out to those people. Could not even begin to explain it to you. Most people have never seen the pictures or the videos of us in Africa. Because I can't talk to people about it. Because it's very hard to talk to people about something so precious to you. You get some American, you show them the pictures, they're chewing gum. Oh, that's nice. No, no, no. You don't understand. Let me put the album away. You don't understand what God did there. You don't understand who these people are. You don't understand. You don't know what God did. You weren't there when the blind eyes were open and the deaf ears were open. You weren't there 
when God did what no man could take credit for. You weren't there when you're hugging a person that smells like trash, but you love him more than your mother, and you can't explain it. My God, this is Jesus. That's the gospel, my friend. When are you going to begin to when are you going to begin to live out the adventure and the dream that God has for you? You become a father to the fatherless. I'd fight for these kids. I'd give my life for these kids. And God wants to do that with every person. I never wanted to be a pastor. He loved me into the ministry. God loved me so much. He was so patient with me, so amazing to me, so good to me, that my only response is, Lord, what do you want from me? I'll do whatever you want. I got nothing, Lord. Why is it so hard for people to get to that place? I got nothing. I got nothing. Just come. Do whatever you want to do. The problem is you don't know what you're missing on the other side because you've never experienced it. The power of the cross, the power of the blood of Jesus, the Holy Ghost, Pentecost. It's real. Nobody can talk me out of it. I've been out there. I'm so far gone. You're in your altered reality, criticizing. But you don't know that you're blind. I'm just going to stay out there. Amen? My friend, what am I trying to get you to to this place? Don't not waste your life. There's so much potential on the inside of you. If God could use somebody as foolish as me, what can he do with you? Amen? I was not a natural born leader. People see me as a strong leader, you know, like I'm so type A, you know, can believe for everything or whatever, whatever, you know, people think. I'm this like super over the top, whatever, leader. I was never a leader. I was never a leader. God made me a leader. Are you listening to me? My hero growing up was my big brother. You know the story. That's who I was without Jesus. People didn't even call me by my name. People called me Little Ricardo, and I was proud. I was proud of that because I loved my brother that much. All my friends were my brother's friends. I followed him around, and I loved it, every, bit, every minute of it. We had a great upbringing. I loved my brother. But I was happy following him behind the scenes. <laughs> I'm hiding behind my brother, and God says, you. And when God says, you, I'm saying, yes, it's Ricky. I know it's my brother. And he says, no, 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 no. I'm talking to you. And I wrestled with this for years. Many of you in this place, everything about yourself is about yourself. You disqualify yourself because you're thinking about who you are in the flesh. But that's not what God sees. God sees past all that. You actually don't even know who you are. And so you allow God to reveal to you who you are. Are you listening to me? And for years, I literally had arguments, like almost fist fights, because I was a work in progress with my brother, yelling at him. I'm only doing this because you won't step up. And I would fight with him. You need to be the one that preaches. And I would even tell him things like, the firstborn is the one with the birthright. It's not me. But I was the David, the insignificant one, the behind-the-scenes one, amen? And God calls Davids. Are you listening to me? 
Many people in this place, you think you're insignificant, but that's who God likes to use. God likes to use the insignificant ones because he gets more glory out of those. Are you listening to me? The humble and the broken. That's why when I went to Africa, he said, go into the, go into the highways and the byways and compel the lost. Go to the humble and the broken. Go, go there. Go to the field. That when men go beyond the field, they see the field and all they see is just woods overgrown. Nobody wants this piece of property. Oh, it's yucky. That's not the piece of real estate we want. We want the, one, the nice one in the city. But God says, no, there's a treasure in the field. And for those that are willing to pay the price and to go through the field will find the treasure. Are you listening to me? And you've got to pay the price. To go through the field and to go where other people don't want to go. Amen? It's an unknown path. What do you mean give my life to Jesus? What do you mean I got a career? I studied computer science. I have all these certifications. What do you mean? I, I got to lay all that down to just follow this path that I don't know where it leads? Where God tells me there's a treasure somewhere in here? That's what I'm telling you. That's the price. And that is the parable that Jesus told his disciples. There's a field, but there's a treasure in the field. But you have to buy the field to get the treasure. If you choose to pay the price, amen? Everybody wants to go the wide path, but the narrow path, amen? If you, if you choose the narrow path, I'm talking to you today about the narrow path. I'm talking to you about your life. I'm talking to you about not wasting your inheritance, what God's called you to do. Well, I've wasted a lot of time. Listen, God will redeem the time. Are you listening to me? He'll redeem everything. Stop thinking about the past. He'll redeem it. He'll make it right. How? I don't know. That's his business. He's God. Eh? He's the one with the miracles, not me. My friend, Jesus is calling you today. Will you follow him? Will you take him by the hand? Will you trust him? Will you follow him and say, Lord, I trust you. I don't know what I'm doing, but I trust you, God. I trust you with my life. I give you everything, Lord. I lay down everything, Lord. I, I trust you, Lord. I trust you with everything. He's calling you today. He's calling you to a higher place. He wants to use you. The devil is a liar. You are not who you think you are. Allow God to define who you are, my friend. Are you listening to me today? Allow God to define who you are. Don't allow your friends, your family to define who you are. Allow Jesus to define who you are. He wants to use you. The power of God's in this place. What about just close your eyes? God's touching people all over this place. Father, I thank you, Lord, for your precious Holy Spirit. Kyle, I want you to bring, bring him to the front right here. The Holy Ghost is on him. Father, I thank you, Lord. The Lord's going to use him. Yes? Bring him to the front. God's going to use this young man. The hand of God is on your life. The hand of God is on your life. God's going to use you. You're not insignificant. And the power of God's on you even now. You say, Lord, how are you going to do it? Don't question me, my son. I will do a great thing. And I will give you wisdom. Even in the markets and the areas of life that you've been asking for. I will give you supernatural wisdom, says the Lord. And I will use you in the financial sector for my glory. In the name of Jesus. It's the fire of the Holy Ghost. It's the fire of the Holy Ghost. I'll use you. I'll rearrange you. I've chosen you. For you asked me one time, Lord, are you really real? Oh, I want some of that. Can I have some of that? And you've cried out. You're hungry. And the Lord sees your heart. And he's going to use you. He's going to use you in a mighty way. You have such a heart of compassion that God gave you that heart. And a lot of people don't know about it, but it's in there. It's compassion. His compassion. God's going to use you. 
I see God raising you up in the area of finances. And you're going to start projects around the world. And you'll go to third world countries. And you'll do whole projects for the humble and the broken. God will give you such a compassion for them. People in the villages, outcast people, people nobody cares about. And you'll go in those areas and you'll move the needle. And God will give you wisdom, supernatural wisdom. And the hand of God will be on everything you do. That's the fire of the Holy Ghost. That's the fire of the Holy Ghost. Yes, more. The fire of the Holy Ghost. I'll burn out everything you struggle with. Fire of the Holy Ghost. Take you. Rearrange you. It'll shake you. It'll use you. It's the fire of the Holy Ghost. Bring him right here. My God. That's the fire of God. Right here. That's the fire of the Holy Ghost. God's going to use you. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The fire of God. The fire of God. My God. There's so many people going to be traveling places. I see you. We're going to travel to many nations around the world. There's a season when this ministry is going to travel. And you will go places with us. That's the fire of the Holy Ghost. And God will give you a passion for the lost. Oh. The humble. The broken. Cities. Townships. Villages, cities, townships, villages. Some will fund it. Others will preach. And everything in between. Wisdom. Supernatural infrastructure. In the name of Jesus. In the, it's the fire of God in the name of Jesus. Just allow him to burn out everything that does not belong. Hey. Supernatural. It's supernatural. It's supernatural. It's supernatural. It's supernatural. It's supernatural. God has given you as a couple a mercy ministry. And you are anointed to do that. And by the mercy that God has bestowed upon you, when you serve people, they'll see Jesus in your smile. They'll see Jesus in your hands. They'll see Jesus even in your eyes as you, as you minister to people with your compassion. Hey, That's what the Lord wants to use you guys. Mercy ministry. And I see villages. You'll go to the villages. You'll go places. You'll go places you never dream. God will give you wisdom to do things you'd never imagine. And that's the fire of the Holy Ghost. That's the fire of the Holy Ghost. God's given you a heart of compassion, Charlie. And that same love that you feel when you hug people, people are going people to feel his presence. They're going to feel the love of Jesus. You love people. God gave you that. It's a gift. Mercy. Compassion. You see people the way he sees them. Jesus. Jesus. Jesus, the fire of God. The wind of God on your back. Rosambrote. Wind of God on your back. Forget about what people say. Who cares? People say a lot of things. It's time to serve Jesus. It's time to serve Jesus. People say a lot of things and do nothing. It's time to serve God. It's time to consecrate. Don't miss out on what God has for you. Do not miss out. Do not miss out. Do not miss out. Step in. Step into what God has for you. Step in and step into it. Step into it comfortable behind the scenes. Step into it. Step into what God has for you. Don't be afraid. 
Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus. It's the fire of God on you right now, Cody, in the name of Jesus. The fire of God. Fire on everything you do. Everything you put your hand to multiplies in the name of Jesus. I see you starting a business. I see you starting a business by the Holy Ghost. God's going to give you wisdom. You're going to start a business in the name of Jesus. A fire of God in the name of Jesus. It'll be a, it'll be a kingdom business. Jesus' name. God's going to raise you up. God's going to raise you up. My life is not my own. Lord, whatever you want from me, you can have it. My life is not my own. Come. Do what no man can take credit for. Come and use me, oh God. Rearrange me. Do whatever it is that you have to do. Not my will, but yours be done. Jesus' name. Fire of God's fallen in this place. All over this place. Lord, come. Would you come? Come, Lord Jesus. It's very easy to point the finger. It's very hard to humble yourself and do what God's called you to do. It's time to do what God's called us to do. In the name of Jesus. Come here, Edwin. Power of God's on you. This year is going to be a it's going to be a breakthrough year. I said, it's going to be a breakthrough year in the name of Jesus. Breakthrough year. Breakthrough year. Hey, Shabbat Acceleration. <laughs> Jesus. Breakthrough year. Be faithful. God's going to raise you up. Yes, the Lord will do it. <laughs> God's going to raise you up. Step up into what God has for you. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. I am with you. Do not be afraid. I will give you the words to say. I will use you. I will do the work. Do not be afraid. Lord, I give you my life. I give you everything. I hold nothing back. I want nothing from nobody. I just want you, Lord. I just want you. Come, Jesus. Come, Jesus. Nobody will ever love you like Jesus. Nobody can love you like Jesus. The Bible says you can go to the highest mountain, and there he will find you. You can go to the deepest ocean, and there he will find you. Nothing will ever be able to separate you from God's love. He loves you. Jesus loves you. Loves you. 
He loves you. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. It's about surrender. It's about surrender. When you give him all of you, you can have all of him. every head bowed, every eye closed. I believe in miracles. I believe in miracles. With every head bowed and every eye closed, it's very simple. The Bible says 2,000 years ago at Calvary's cross, Jesus came. And he paid the price for your sin. He became your advocate, your standby. You could not pay your price for your sin. So Jesus stepped up and said, I'll pay it. With my life. So Jesus traded in his life for yours. So that you can be free. He died and he went to hell for you. Jesus experienced what you deserved, which was death and hell. But the Bible says hell could not hold him because he was blameless. So he went to hell and he took the keys from the devil. And the Bible says on the third day he rose from the dead. And he wears the victor's crown. His name is Jesus, and he loves you with all of his heart. And today he cries out for you, and he says, I love you. I gave my life for you. I stood for you. One of the things that people don't realize is that Jesus died on the cross openly before men so that everybody could see him. He was not ashamed. He died openly. Jesus stood for you. Will you stand for him today? Will you stand for him? If you're sitting here in this place and you're not sure of your salvation, you sit there and you say, you know what, Pastor Alex? To be honest with you, I am not sure 100% that if I die today, that heaven is my home. If you want to be 100% sure today, or you say, Pastor Alex, I know that I'm not living my life right. I'm not living the way I should. And you want to make it right today. I want you to come to the front right now in Jesus' name. Make that fresh commitment today. Have you got to make a fresh commitment today? Or you're going to receive Jesus for the first time today. You say, you know what? Pastor Alex, today I'm going to make Jesus my Lord and Savior. Or if you have prayed the prayer in the past, but you've fallen away from your commitment to Jesus. And you say, Pastor Alex, you know what? I've act I haven't honored my commitment to the Lord. And today I want to consecrate myself. I want you to come to the front. My friend, I want to tell you something here today. Your life is very valuable. God wants to use you. Your life is very valuable.
Jesus wants to come inside your vessel, he could do amazing things. Jesus wants to come in your body. And he wants to love people. And he wants to create things. And he wants to multiply things. And he wants to help people through you. You're not insignificant. You're very significant. You're very significant. There's only one thing that causes men to go to hell. Only one thing. And that's pride. If you're ashamed of Jesus before men, the Bible says he'll be ashamed of you before the angels in heaven. That's why we have altar calls. A lot of times people are like, you know what? I don't need to go to an altar call. You know, it's between me and God. That's not the way it works. Because the Bible, the Bible doesn't say your faith and your salvation is just between you and God. No, the Bible says that you have to publicly declare before men that Jesus is your Lord and Savior. Are you listening to me? Publicly. That's why we do altar calls, by the way. And that's why we also do water baptism. In Bible times, and water baptism has always been that way throughout history, water baptism is done with the local body in the community for all men to see your commitment to Jesus. Amen? That's why we do these things. Amen? Because it takes humility to receive Jesus. Amen? Everybody's got to walk through that door of humility. That's why I don't believe in like watering down the altar call. Oh, let me soften the area. Let me soften the barrier of entry. Let me not talk about repentance and sin and just soften it up. No, there's no softening it up. We have to preach the real gospel. Amen? People have to repent. Amen? And they have to receive Jesus in their heart. And they have to be willing to publicly declare it. Amen? Jesus died for you. Will you die for him? Amen? Because you got to die to yourself. you got to lay down your life. And that's what this is all about. I couldn't tell you how many altar calls for salvation I personally answered. Like, I could not even count. How many times I rededicated my life to the Lord. I and I've answered so many altar calls. Listen to me. Listen to me. I've answered in my life so many altar calls that I could not even remember. Many different churches, crusades, many altar calls. Listen to me. And there are people on this planet that will not answer one altar call, not one. And they're going to stand before Jesus one day. That's pride. That's what pride does. Amen? Hell was not made for any man. Hell was not made for one person. Hell was made for the devil. People choose to go to hell because of pride. They're not willing to humble themselves. You listening to me? So I'm going to make a last altar call here. Anybody else that wants to come up? If you want to rededicate your life, or if you want to receive Jesus for the very first time, I want you to come to the front. Right now, in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, Jesus. 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 You got to understand, God loves people. He loves people. He loves you. He's for you. He's not against you. He loves you. Will you stand for me? Will you come and stand for me? Says the Lord. I stood for you. I shed my blood for you. Will you stand for me? Will you stand for me? I love you. He loves you. He loves you. Jesus loves you. You know, many times people ask, what makes a man? What makes a man a man? What makes a man a man is to acknowledge that he's lost without a Savior. That's what makes a man a man. Stand for Jesus. You stand for him strong. Lord, I'm coming. I'm coming, Lord. <laughs> I'm coming, Jesus. I love you. I love you.
coming. Here, I'm coming, Lord. I remember the first time I heard it. I'm coming. You came for me, I'm coming for you now. Jesus loves you. He's going to use you. Standing in front of me, there are many people called to many different things. Some are called to ministry. God will use you in the ministry. Some are called to business. God will give you creative ideas, witty inventions. He'll give you secret treasure in hidden places, the Bible says. He'll give you wisdom beyond your years. He'll take your natural. He'll add, he'll add his super. You'll be supernatural. He'll multiply the work of your hands. He'll be about you as a wall of fire. He'll protect you. He'll be a mighty, strong tower that you can hide under. He'll lift you up on angels' wings and give you eyes to see. It's Jesus, and he loves you. He loves you. It's Jesus. It's my Jesus. He loves you. There's no condemnation. There's no shame. He took it for you at the cross. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. He's for you. It's not against you. He loves you. He loves you. Well, one prayer fits all. Anybody else wants to come, you can join them now. One prayer fits all. I want everybody to say, Jesus, thank you for coming and dying for me on the cross. Father, you didn't just tell me you love me. But you sent your most prized possession. You sent the thing you love the most to demonstrate your love for me. You sent your only begotten son to die on the cross for my sin, for my guilt, for all of my shame. You sent your son to die for me. Jesus came. And he suffered on the cross. He suffered the punishment of my sin. He took it. He suffered for me. He bore my sickness, my disease. He took it so that I don't have to have it. So today, I am healed. I am set free. And I am delivered because of what Jesus did on the cross. 2,000 years ago, he shed his blood for me. He died for me. But death could not hold him. And he rose from the dead on the third day. Jesus, you're alive. You're a living Savior. You're my living Savior. And today, I invite you to my heart afresh. Come. Be my Lord be my Savior. Not my will, but yours be done. Lord, help me by the power of the Holy Spirit to honor my commitment to you, to serve you all the days of my life, to honor you, to give everything for you, to lay down my life for you, even if it costs my life. Today, I give you me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, just thank him. <laughs> thank you, Jesus. He did it for me. You didn't have to, but you did it for me. You shed your blood. You hung on that cross. You loved me when I was unlovable. You believed in me when nobody believed in me. When I was ashamed, you told me, stand up tall. You're forgiven.
when I thought I was unforgivable, when I let you down, you told me, just look at the cross. I've already forgiven you. Father, your grace I'll never understand. And I thank you, Jesus, for your mercy and how you never quit on me. And I'm never going to quit on you, Lord. Help me serve you, Lord, all the days of my life. Help me, God. Come on, just ask him to help you. Help me, God. Help me, Lord. Help me surrender more. Help me lay down the things I need to lay down. Help me make the right decisions. Help me make the adjustments. Help me, God. Father, I pray let 2022 be the best year of my life where I hold nothing back from you, Lord. I hold nothing back from you, Lord. I hold nothing back from you, Jesus. Help me, Jesus. Help me in my weakness. Help me, Jesus. You know, he said he, he's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. And he promised us. He says, lo, I will be with you even until the end. He's Jesus, and he loves you. Never doubt it. You can never disappoint him because of the cross. He loves you. You are made perfect in his sight. Come on, just give him thanks. I want everybody to stand up in this place. Just give Jesus thanks for what he did on the, for us on the cross. Father, we thank you, Jesus. Let 2022 be the year, Lord, where I consecrate everything. And everybody in the crowd, everybody. We all need to consecrate ourselves. It's not just people up here. Everybody, make a fresh commitment, Lord. This year, Father, I'm going to consecrate myself like never before. Lord, help me consecrate myself. Help me read the Bible, Lord. Give me a hunger for the things of God, Lord. Give me a passion for the lost, Lord. Give me a boldness, God, to preach the gospel. He'll change you. He's the one that brings the change. Amen? You know, your situation can change a whole lot faster than you can dream. It can change a whole lot faster. You just humble yourself. Thank you, Lord. So what I want you to do, even this week, I want you to start practicing your praise. Amen? You need to begin to start thanking God for everything he did for you. Amen? Keep reminding the devil of what God did for you at Calvary. Amen? That's where praise comes from. Look, the enemy's going to try to throw things at you. And you need to remind him constantly of what Jesus did for you on the cross. Oh, you're a liar. No, 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 no. I'm going to quench those fiery darts because I got the shield of faith. Amen? And the shield of faith protects my heart from the fiery darts of the devil. Devil, you're a liar. I cast out every vain imagination that exalts itself against God's truth for my life. This is what God says about my life, and I cast down everything that would speak against what God has to say about me. Amen? That's what it means to cast down every vain imagination. Get what God has for you, and cast down every thought and every imagination that would speak contrary to what God has told you. Amen? He's for you. He's for you. He's not against you. There's nothing but grace because of the cross. Amen? And so we are thankful. Amen? Wake up every morning. Give him thank you. Say thank you, Jesus. This morning I woke up and I said, Lord, help me. That's how I wake up. I'm telling you, most of my mornings, I wake up. The very first thing I say is, Lord, help me. I don't even crawl out of bed. I just wake up and my very first thing I say is, Lord, help me today. Help me today, Jesus. Like from my heart. Like genuinely. Like if he was right next to me, because he is. He's actually in me. Amen? And I say to Jesus, Lord, help me today. Amen? Live your life aware of his presence. Amen? Will you do that, church? Live your life aware that he's on the inside of you. Talk to him that way. 
I'm telling you, I wake up. And I say, Jesus, help me. Help me today. Give me the strength for today. Lord, give me the wisdom. Help me today. Help me, Jesus. Amen? Help me. And he'll help you. Amen? Amen? And practice your praise. Amen? One day we're all going to be coming in here dancing, acting crazy. And we're not going to do it out of hype, but we're going to do it out of a revelation of who he is. Amen? I'm just telling you. Just give him praise. Thank him. You have a lot to be thankful for. How many of you guys have a lot to be thankful for? So much to be thankful for. Amen. Well, we're going to wrap it up today. Man, do you love Jesus? I'm just telling you, I don't know a lot about a lot. But one thing I do know is I love Jesus. Amen? I just love Jesus. I love Jesus. And I want to do everything he's called me to do. If it's not inside of the call of God in my life, I'm blind to it. I'm not interested in it. I only want to do what God's called me to do. And I only want to be with the people God's called me to be with. Amen? I'm not called to save the world. That's his job. I have a part to play, amen? And I just want to play my part, amen? Do you want to play your part? Come on. I just want to play my part. I want to be faithful to do my part, amen? And to help those that I'm called to help. I'm going to tell you, you're not going to be able to help everybody, amen? I've gone out and ministered to thousands, hundreds of thousands of people, preach on television, blah, 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 blah. All the glory goes to Jesus. But there are people in my family I can't even reach. They won't listen to me. Why? Because the only thing they see is they see, they see Alexis Burgos. They don't see the man of God. They might never see it. Remember, Jesus was not accepted in his hometown. Because they were like, that's Jesus. He's the, guy, he's the carpenter's son. That's, you understand what I'm saying? So you're not going to be able to reach everybody. Amen? I'm not interested in reaching everybody because I'm not Jesus. I can't reach everybody. But there are some people that I can't reach. Amen? And I'm going to do everything in my power to reach them. Will you? Come on, somebody. Somebody will listen to you. Not everybody will. Everybody won't listen to you. But some people will listen to you. Amen? And you'll be able to influence them. You'll be able to speak to them about Jesus. And many people will give their heart to Jesus because of your testimony and because of your step of obedience. Come on, somebody. Can I get an amen? Isn't that amazing? Many people, untold, hundreds of thousands represented in this place because of your testimony. Amen? Share your testimony. That's the only thing I know to tell people. I could just tell you what Jesus did for me. Amen? And hope that you would be hungry enough and curious enough to pursue it and seek it out for yourself. Amen? Share your testimony. Tell people what Jesus did for you. Amen? Tell them how wonderful he is. Tell them the very first time you ever felt his love. Amen? Tell them about your sins forgiven. Amen? Tell them about your godly marriage that God restored. Are you listening to me? Tell them about the business that he helped you build. Are you listening to me? Tell them about the beautiful children that he helped you raise. Tell them. Will you tell them? Will you tell them about Jesus? Come on, somebody. I'm going to tell them. Amen? Well, amen. I want everybody to bow your heads. We're going we're gonna to wrap this up. Amen. Everybody say, Jesus. Father, I thank you this week will be a week of divine testimonies. Supernatural testimonies. Lord, this week, I'm going to consecrate myself. I'm going to spend time in your word. Help me, Lord. Give me the hunger to even hunger after you. This year, 2022, will be the best year of my life. I will not hold back anything from you, Lord. Not my will, but yours be done. In the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody in this place said... Amen. Come on. Hey, come on. Give Jesus a clap. Come on. I love Jesus. Well, we love you guys. We'll see you next week. God bless you. Thank you, Jesus.